All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for your patience. We know we're just a smidge late, but hopefully it's worth waiting for. I am Amanda McCrossin. I am so excited to be hosting this Harvest at Home series all month in September celebrating California Wine Month. And I'm honored to be joined here by a friend and a colleague to talk about, I'm not going to speak for her, but I think it's her favorite region, Napa Valley. So welcome, Vanessa Conlin, Master of Wine and Head of Wine at Wine Access. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm not sure um, why you would guess that it's my favorite region, maybe because I'm sitting right in the heart of it here, <laughs> um, since I, I actually live in Napa Valley. Um, so very dear to my heart. Um, love the wines, love the people, um, love the place. It's really a magical part of the world. And I'm really excited that you asked me to be a part of this. So thank you. Yes. No, I couldn't think of a better person. And, you know, we spend so much time together anyway. Why not just continue yes. the conversation? That's um, right. <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to taste three really amazing wines today and mm. talk about Napa Valley. But I wanted to kick this sort of off because you didn't grow up in Napa Valley. I didn't grow up in Napa Valley. And we both worked in New York City before we arrived in Napa Valley. So I wanted to sort of kick this off with what did you think of when you thought of Napa Valley before yeah. you lived here versus what you think of it now that you do live here? Well, I mean, I knew of it, of course, as the world famous growing region that it is. I sold Napa wines um, in New York City. I was the buyer for two retail shops and for a wine bar. And of course, you know, um, Napa has uh, such a cachet. And so, you know, I, I knew of it as this kind of like region that I just thought was sort of, you know, in the clouds and, and, and unattainable. And I came out here and what really struck me was that while these wines are world class, um, the people are so down to earth. Yes. And everyone was so excited. You know, I'd visit um, the wineries and they were so open and just like free with information. And they took such pride in what, mm -hmm. in what they do um, mm -hmm. that it just made me have even that much more respect for, for them. Um, and there's also this really spirit um, of, of sharing information among mm -hmm. vintners that I think, you know, Robert Mondavi really set the tone yes. for, which is like all ships rise, rise with the tide. And so also, you know, I'm sure you've visited other wine, uh, wine making regions where people sort of, you know, they covet their mm -hmm. information and they try to keep it very proprietary. And that's not the case here at all. Mm -mm. You know, you'll, you'll see wine making teams from what you think of as competitors, you know, visiting each other and they'll kind of just open up this, the cellar door and say, look at this cool thing we're, we're trying <laughs> and let me tell you about it and here, taste it. And so, yeah. so I guess the answer to go back to your original question, what I, what I learned after um, visiting, but then moving here and getting more immersed is just what an amazing community this is and mm -hmm. how hospitable it is as a region yes. to, yeah. to, to, to visitors, you know, um, it's just people love to talk about Napa and share it with people. So, uh, so yeah, I guess, I guess that was the biggest surprise. Yeah. I think those are great points and something that struck me as well when, it, when I moved out here was just this open arms, we embrace you. This is, and I think what people forget is that even though Napa Valley is on a global stage and, and a very important wine region, it is a small community. I mean, Napa mm -hmm. County itself is about 140,000 people. And that, that comprises, you know, the towns of St. Helena, the town of Oakville, right. the town of Calistoga. I mean, even the Napa proper. Um, and so there is this sort of tight knit community and you feel that on a daily basis, you feel it even more so in more trying times, like, you know, when we've had fires or natural disasters in the past, oh. but it is really amazing to not only work in the industry that you love so much, but to work in a place where it feels like it's yeah. a very small town. Totally. Um, and I think the other thing that really struck me was, you know, in New York City, you really only get a tiny sliver of what's available in Napa Valley. Right, and right. it's not really until you're oh, here, yeah, yeah. you yeah. realize how much diversity you have in this teeny tiny little region. I mean, it's mm -hmm. only what, three miles north to south, and five, five miles, miles across, and yeah. it contains half of the world's geological soil types, which is mm -hmm. just super cool, a Mediterranean climate that only about 1% of, of the world enjoys, which, you know, we enjoy as well, ha having lived there. <laughs> the grapes love it, but we love it too, because it's warm yep. and it's dry and it just feels so good and it makes for yeah. such a wonderful experience. I'm sure if you're a grape on the vine, just kind of cruising through harvest, um, enjoying yourself. But there is such a diversity, even within 
this very, very tiny little sector of Northern California, which, you know, you're only, um, you know, 50, 60 miles north of the San Francisco Bay. We've got the, the fog influence. Um, and I think, you know, to, to get here and to experience not only the diversity of styles, but the, the diversity of terroir. Yeah. So all of the different things that these different ADAs can offer. I think you're exactly right. And and I think, um, you know, two things that you said that I think are really interesting. One is, yes, like w coming from New York, I knew some of these names on the bottles, but when you get here, you realize how many sort of small projects, passion projects there are, people that really mm -hmm. don't make it outside of the region or make it very, very in small, very small quantities. Um, but to your point about sort of diversity of soils, I think also we we know that Cabernet Sauvignon is is the most planted grape and and very important, but there are so many different varieties planted here. I think there's like you know yes. over three dozen, and uh, you know I just um, led a panel discussion earlier this week on Ribola Jala, which is a you know a, a variety Crazy. from Friuli, you know, in Slovenia. <laughs> and who knew I had six winemakers on, you know, who all make who all make Ribola Jala right here in Napa yes. Valley. So it's it's incredibly and in diverse very different in so styles. Ways. In very different styles, yes. All yeah. really high quality um again like there's there's a lot of passion behind the winemaking here um but such yes. diversity yeah well i think you've you've kicked it off perfectly for us because we are talking about a variety that i don't think a lot of people no. think of when they think of napa valley which is riesling and so you know, we, you know as much as we're definitely going to have some cabernet today for sure but riesling is an important variety to napa valley mm -hmm. and Stony Hill, just a really classic, iconic producer of this particular variety. And once upon a time, you could find Riesling, you know, in the last uh, century and a half, you could find it very regularly across the valley, um, even in, in places that you could never even think of having it now, like Pritchard Hill and yes. Eisen Vineyard once upon a time that, that used to be uh, the Araujo Vineyard that now Chateau Latour owns. Um, there were some very important places that had Riesling and Stony Hill, uh, a very, very old property founded in the 1940s by Eleanor yeah. and Frederick Ray. Um, you know, they really loved white burgundy and they got here and they were like, let's just plant it all to Chardonnay. And they were like, ah, you know, why don't you diversify a little bit? So they ended up planting just a little bit of Riesling and Pinot Blanc. They're situated sort of at higher elevation on Spring Mountain. And have you been there before, Vanessa? I have, I have been there. I've, I've been there twice. I was I was there um, when I was visiting when I lived uh, in New York and they were so kind and they host, you know, the family hosted, hosted me and my husband. And then I visited again um, a few years later and of course got to meet um, the then winemaker, Mike, um, and tour the cellars. So it's, it's really, it has so much history. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you, you probably can, can explain this better than anyone since you're, you know, um, uh, ran a, the wine program here at press for so long and had these amazing um, Napa wineries. But I think um, people in the industry get so excited when they see Stony Hill on yes. a wine list, right? Yes. Because I think, I think of it as, um, as a property that not only makes exceptional wines, but white wines that can age. Yes. Yes. And those were, I mean, to your point, yes, I was very fortunate working at press for as long as I did. I got to taste some of these Rieslings that were from the 70s, from the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you poured me uh, just, back in the day, like some really old Chardonnay from the property. And I, and I know they, I, I love that you picked Riesling because I know, I know people know um, <laughs> Stony Hill for a Chardonnay, but, but yeah, the, this Riesling and also Gewürztraminer that they make, which yes. is really extraordinary as yeah. well. I love that wine. Yeah. I, I love this wine. I think it's such a classic and Riesling in Napa Valley, you know, there are several great examples of this. It's not just Stony Hill making it. I mean, there's still some smaller producers that we love seeing. Um, but I, you know, I do think if we're talking about Napa Valley Riesling as me compared to Rieslings from the rest of the world, where do you think this sort of falls for people? You know, if you are someone that loves Riesling um, just across the board, what, where are we on the spectrum? Well, I mean, I think, you know, Riesling, what I love about Riesling is it's really able to express the place where it's grown. So mm -hmm. it's almost, it's, it's almost hard to find, it's almost hard to find a really direct comparison. I mean, I think anyone who likes, this is a dry Riesling, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, so I think anyone who enjoys, uh, you know, Trocken styles uh, from Germany um, would be a fan of this. I think though, it also, um, it has this sort of, um, uh, body to it as well that that uh, reminds me of Austrian Rieslings. Mm -hmm. uh, 
in a way, you know? Yeah. So, so it sort of has this more, it's a little bit more structured than I think of some, this really lacy, delicate German, German Rieslings. So it's kind yeah. of maybe a cross between, between those two stylistically. But again, because Riesling is so, it's, it's so able to express a place. It, there's really nothing quite like Riesling from Napa. <laughs> yes. No, I, I, I agree with you that. And I think you're right. I think when we think of body, of this wine it is something that sort of stands out because aromatically and we love we love riesling because it's so aromatic mm -hmm. right you know you yes. you get some of those petrol notes a little bit of like white flowers sometimes you get um some honeysuckle you know you can get a wide array of different things with riesling and i think all of those things exist but for this particular riesling and i think this speaks to napa valley riesling there is this notion of of viscosity so that you know that yeah. word that we that we use to describe how it like how it sits on your palate, how it sort yeah. of, you know, does it like move across like water? Um, you know, something like to your point earlier, German reasoning, or is it like a little creamier and, you mm -hmm. know, does it linger just a little bit longer and give you more of that, like that dance, that yeah. weight. Um, and I think this gives you a little bit of both. It's somewhere in both. between. Yep. And yeah, um, still had that beautiful, is, that beautiful acidity, but yeah, that sort of textural, um, mm -hmm. like spherical shape on the palate, which I really mm -hmm. love. And something I do want to mention, because I think that, you know, California in general, you know, think of California, I grew up in the East Coast, and I know you spend a lot of time in the East Coast as well, you know, yeah. you think of California, right? And you think yeah. of like surfers and like, you know, people in the sun and like palm trees, right? Like those are the right. things that you got yeah. to see on Saved by the Bell right. when you were younger. Right. Um, <laughs> and then you move out here and you're like, it's not totally accurate, but it's also not totally inaccurate. Inaccurate. In that, yeah. <laughs> in that people are a little bit more laid back here. Yes. But they also pay attention to the land and they pay attention to, you know, the environment and they are sort of a little bit more like one with the earth. And I think California for all that it is wonderful. The thing that I think I love most yeah. is this is the fact that we have so many um, wineries and growing regions that are practicing sustainable agriculture mm -hmm. and incorporating things like lead certified buildings when they're when they're yeah. redoing their wineries. And Stony Hill, I think, you know, and two of the other producers we have today, they're they're like minded in that they are um, they're thinking about those things. And so Stony yeah. Hill has been dry farmed since its inception. I don't, yeah. I actually didn't even realize that until I was wow. going back and doing some research that literally since day one, since these vines were planted, they have been dry farmed. Um, wow. And I just think yeah. that's incredible. And they are also Napa green certified. And I think that's another really important yeah. um, distinction within Napa Valley is that there is a uh, courtesy of a program that has been uh, put in place to get the entire Valley Napa green certified. So that means, you know, sustainable yeah. farming, you know, what they're doing in the vineyard uh, and then what they're also doing in the winery. So, you know, everything that they can do to minimize that carbon footprint uh, is, yep. is something that is just as important as what is happening in the winemaking facilities uh, on the, on the wine front and what's happening yeah. in the actual grape juice. So yeah, I think no. that is just super cool. I, I think you're, I, I think that's a great point. And, and people here are so, so, um, committed to to the the land to preservation of the land mm -hmm. to conservation um and you know what i like to remind people too about things like sustainability is yes it's about energy yes it's about water um but it's also about the health of your employees and the people yes. you know mm -hmm. and so keeping in mind that that you know the entire the entire business needs to be sustainable you know yes. including people uh, yes. and their and their health and their happiness so yeah. um I, I really i really commend them. Um, and, you know, I think Napa, we had the first agricultural preserve in the United States, I believe, yes. you know, it's a long history of, you know, um, recognizing what a great growing region we have, but really mm -hmm. pr protecting it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's so fun to dive into this region. I think, you know, I, I get excited to talk about Napa Valley and I think yeah. I think you can feel, hopefully you can feel that, hopefully you guys <laughs> can feel that. I get yeah. really passionate about it. I know you do too. And just having Absolutely. having lived here and worked here for so long, there is, um, and you know, we'll talk about other regions uh, that I'm yeah. equally as passionate about down the line, but you know, Napa Valley having lived here, there were so many things that I didn't know covered as I've gotten to know this place. And it really just is so, magical and you know yeah. on the surface you think of it as like as we were talking about before you know you think of the big iconic producers you think of mandavi you think of this one you think yeah. of silver oak you think of Camus, and they're all amazing and then you get here and you're like they're also they're just as great 
as the other ones down the street. You know, it's yeah. just, it's an amazing place to be and it just gets more magical every single day. I cannot, I'm actually not in Napa Valley right now. I'm so excited to get back home because I that know. very first drive, <laughs> do you, you travel a lot. So that very first drive when you're getting back from, from SFO yeah. and you're driving up like Highway 29 or Silverado Trail and that first like wave of vineyard that comes at you yeah. is just, it's like it's like pulling up to Disney World for the first time as a kid. Like it's just so cool every time. It, you're so right. And yeah, I remember well coming back from travels. You know, there is this moment where you're just like, oh, and you just kind of exhale, and you're like, <laughs> oh, this is what life is mm -hmm. supposed to be like, you know. And mm -hmm. and there's there's um what I what I love about it too is there's there's um there's like this perfume in the air all the time. Mm -hmm. That's so distinctive where you really smell like the place, all the things growing here. I love that um, during harvest, you know, when people start fermenting, you can drive up the valley and you can literally smell fermentation like yes. in your car yes. <laughs> because all everyone else <laughs> it's are the best. Wine. It's totally the best. Um, and, but kind of going back to what we were talking about before in terms of sort of protecting the land and, and all that. And, and it's not a super densely packed place with, you know, high rises mm -hmm. and strip malls, obviously, because we, we protected that. And it reminds me of um, when I first, when I first moved out here from New York, you know, I lived on 81st street uh, between uh, Amsterdam and Columbus on the Upper West side. And uh -huh. that's also where the Crosstown bus you know, crosses, mm -hmm. crosses over there. And there's just like the slightest hill. And so the bus driver, like when they hit the gas there, it sounded like an airplane taking off every time, you know, a <laughs> hundred times a day. And I didn't realize actually how desensitized I'd gotten to, to, mm. to, to sound, you know, mm -hmm. um, because you have this like constant um, onslaught of your senses in, in New York City. And I remember the first night that I spent in here when we moved, it was so yes. quiet. It was so quiet <laughs> that it was like <laughs> deafening. Like I couldn't, I, mm -hmm. I couldn't sleep because I was like where are you? but but now it's you know obviously I, I got very happily adjusted to that quickly but it's such a special place for that for that reason you can come here you can have the most amazing wine you can have world-class meals you can visit beautiful places you can have culture you can mm -hmm. be outside you know whatever you kind of want to do and then yet it's just this beautiful tranquil region at the same time yes, yes. I had the same experience when that flight landed and I got here and I was like, are those actual crickets? Or is like, <laughs> it's someone, <laughs> what's yeah. going on right now? <laughs> it's true. Very true. Um, oh. Well, good, I'm glad to know that I'm not alone. Uh, no. Yeah, no, no it, it, never, it never really ends. And I think you brought up a great point and I think we should migrate to some red wine because why the heck not? Um, I think maybe Zinfandel next, yeah. It's true. Um, yeah, so a great point being there is so much to do in Napa Valley beyond wine tasting. And I know, um, I know people, you know, talk about like Vegas and that way they're like, you can go to Vegas and not gamble. Yeah, you can. There's a lot to do. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> um, Napa Valley, there is so much to do besides wine tasting. Yeah. And yes. obviously we live there. So we, you know, we don't go wine. We taste a lot of wine in our yes. day job, but um, we're well hydrated all times. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but there's so much to do and there's so much great culture and yeah. um, you know everything from amazing restaurants to uh, there's an art house cinema there are art galleries oh, there yeah. are um, concert venues I mean it, yes. you know it's just an amazing place to live yeah, um, yeah. so you know not just drinking the wines but visiting Napa Valley is okay. yeah. just it's just such an all-encompassing experience and I think I think people forget that sometimes like my sister um, I was like, I don't know, like, I don't know if I want to just go wine tasting the whole time. And I was like, you don't understand. Like when you're here, like you, you could potentially do an entire trip and never go to a winery and just yeah. like eat, go to the spa, go mm -hmm. to the, like, you could do a thousand things. Um, yes. and never, I mean, we hope that you're going to go wine tasting because right. we're here, but, right. um, but I do think yeah. that's very, very cool. Oh, um, you're right. Yeah. There are great places to go have cocktails too and yes. breweries if you're into beer. So yes. of course wine is, you know, obviously dear to both yes. of our hearts. But yes, there is there is plenty of plenty of other things to do here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you would, but if you want to. <laughs> um well, you know, I, I think for wine wine tasting has changed so much over the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years in Napa Valley. And you know, we've gone from um wineries where you could just pull up uh and just, you know go into someone's house to like, you know, very formal settings where it's, you know, beautiful crystal and it's, you know, whole hospitality experience. Um, and then you also have things like 
tasting rooms in downtown Napa. Yes. And I love wow. that. I love that wow. downtown Napa has started to like really become a thing. Um, and Brown Estate, this is, this is a really important mm -hmm. winery in Napa Valley. This is the first and only uh, black owned winery in Napa Valley. Uh, this was actually founded initially just as a, as a, as an estate that was growing grapes and selling them. And they were selling yeah. them some, some very prolific properties like Gurgich, you know, Mike Gurgich was a great client. Um, and then the kids came in, they're like, we think we can do this. Like, let's make our own wine. And so in the nineties, they decided to start making their own Zinfandel. And they actually, I don't, you probably know this, but once upon a time, Rombauer was a very famous custom crush facility. Like they made everything from, from Dominus to, um, gosh, who else? I think Canis at one point was, or maybe not Canis, but somebody else, big facility. Um, and so Brown's very first vintages were actually made at Rombauer. Um, and then they ended up building a property, uh, building a winery uh, up on their property, which is in the Child's Valley. And I'm sure you've been to the Child's Valley, right? Yep. It is yeah. like, like oh, yeah. way up there, like way past, like even How Mountain. It is, it's far reaching. And so yeah. the founders of this property actually ended up like they built their own roads up there. They like yeah. everything was done themselves, which is just wild to think about because we're not talking about just like building roads in the valley floor. We're talking like, you know, a thousand feet elevation, yeah. backwoods, you know, tons of trees, lots of things to have to like move and navigate oh, yeah. around. Yeah, it's it's not a place you want to like get halfway there and then realize you forgot something at home and have to go back. It's quite a drive. <laughs> it's a journey. And actually, they're, the very first vineyard that I visited when I moved to Napa Valley was Volker Isley, which is in Child's Valley. And I had no idea how I was like, it's Napa. It's like, you know, everywhere, everywhere's like 20 minutes, right? No, in, in fact, um, it was not 20 minutes. <laughs> it took much longer. Although as a crow flies, it looks like it's going to be much shorter, but it's up a very large mountain with lots of like windy hairpin turns and having moved from New York and only taken the subway for the last five years, not really equipped. Um, <laughs> but I'm really excited to include this for, you know, for a number of reasons. Um, but there was absolutely no escaping this tasting and not including a Zinfandel because I mean, Zinfandel is it's yeah. California's grape. It's America's grape. I mean, it really is such an, you know, Europeans think of Zinfandel and they're like, Oh, the Americans, they drink the Zinfandel, yeah. um, but it's delicious here and it does so well. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, and I think I just wanted to, to make sure to say, I'm glad you made a sort of shout out to like these tasting rooms in Napa. Mm -hmm. It's very different than when I moved here. There really wasn't the opportunity, but I think it's, it's great where, you know, yeah, you can go, you can just walk down the street and try a couple things without having to get in the car if you're staying at a hotel mm -hmm. there um, and, and still have the opportunity to do wine tasting. So it's, it's great. But um, yeah, I think, you know, Zinfandel to your point, it's, it's, it, it's sort of our variety that we've embraced, you know, as, as, as California, but, um, right. but here in Napa, obviously beautiful examples. And um, it makes sense that you say that Mike Gergich would have been buying fruit from Brown because of course he's from Croatia. And um, I think, you know, we found out through genetic testing that that's, you know, variety planted also in, in Croatia and also in, in Puglia known as Primitivo, but mm -hmm. it's like, we own it. We have taken, this is ours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes. And I love that we've embraced it because I think it's a grape that does really well here. It, you know, it certainly loves our, our warmer climate. Um, you think of Primitivo in Italy and it, it does have like a little bit of a, a savory like tanginess to it in, in Italy. This, you know, you feel those sort of through lines, that, you know, the pepperiness, but there is a, you know, a little bit more of a lushness to this wine. And I, yeah. I love this because it's not overly powerful. It's not right. quite as late as you know, Noir, um, but it's fruity and it's fun and it's, you know, it's lighthearted. Yeah, no, I think like, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, it's kind of a, a, a variety, but also this one in particular that can kind of bridge the gap between people who maybe they don't want to drink something as tannic as a Cabernet, maybe, but they also want to drink fuller body than a Pinot Noir because you get uh -huh. this kind of, you know, this this rich fruit, but there is a more like kind of lushness to the tannin than with a Bordeaux mm -hmm. variety. Um, mm -hmm. It makes me really think of like just like last hurrah, a summer barbecues and yes. um, yeah, because it's so food friendly. And I think like with anything off the grill, anything roasted, um, so, so, so delicious and really versatile. Yes. Yeah. And what's more delicious than Zinfandel barbecue? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, is it? No. Mm -mm. No. Although I will say we're going to get to Frog's Leap in a second. We're teaching their Cabernet, but Frog's Leap, Zinfandel, they call that their, um, their pizza and pasta wine. And I think that oh. is, yeah. it's such a, it's also a wonderful pairing. 
Um, you know, Riesling, it can go with a wide array of different things, you know, all of your salads and your raw fishes and, um, mm -hmm. you know, some cheeses. Um, San Vindel, you know, I think this is a great wine. I've got a tiny bit of a chill on this wine right now. And it is just perfect. It, you know, it yeah. feels a little like if you've ever had, I'm sure you have, but you out there, um, like a Cru Beaujolais with just a touch of a yeah. chill. Um, it I just love that. so good. And like, you know, you know, mm -hmm. summertime, it's hot. It's hot here in Florida. Um, but this wine doesn't feel overwhelming. It doesn't feel weighty. It doesn't yeah. feel like, you know, I need to go like take a nap. Um, it's just really, really delicious. And I love that, um, that this is coming from the Child's Valley, uh, which is, you know, an underrated AVA in Napa Valley that we sometimes forget about. Yeah. Yes. Agree. Agree. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad you've, you've kind of teased out some of the more um, off the beaten path, you know, or, or what a lot of people might think of off the beaten path, you know, regions and varieties for this tasting today. It's really fun. Yeah, no, I, I, um, you know, these are, these are wines that are not impossible to find. I think, you know, everything that we selected today, we, we definitely wanted to make sure people weren't going to have to find it in some like obscure wine shop and right. wherever they live. Um, you know, these are regularly, uh, featured on, on, uh, wine retailers, not unlike, yes. uh, wine access, which is, you know, your, yes. your baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, you know, you see these at on restaurant wine lists. You see these at major retailers. Yeah. Um, but they're also beloved by the sommelier and wine community, which I think Definitely. is just so special when you can find yeah. wines mm -hmm. like that that just like you know just universally adored. And I think you know if if I had to sum up these three wines that we're going to be tasting today, just three universally adored wines by all. Like there's no yeah. one that's going to be like, eh, I'm not into it. Um, no, much no. I just think. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, these are these are great. I'm excited also about the frog sleep because we were talking about sustainability. Um, yeah, they they've been they've been so committed to that. Um, I think they had the first LEED certified winery. Is that in in the uh, region? LEED yes. certified wine building in I think it, uh, well I'll double check because I have notes. Um, in all of California, I believe. Wow. I think wow. it was like yeah. Um, let me just double check that because that's yeah first LEED certified. Uh, lead silver certified building in California wine industry. That is their wow. thing of name. Yeah, it's pretty major. Um, yeah, cute. so as, as we migrate from the, uh, um, the oh, I should mention, Brown was the very first to have a hashtag, um, yes. hashtag wine. So you'll see on every label, they've got hashtag Brown Zin, which I just love. Cause that's, you know, we think of white Zin in California and we can just all kind of forget that happened, even though it was the lovely shade of my dress today. Um, <laughs> Not a lot of people to try wine, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? I, I've been seeing white Zin as like making a strange comeback and like sort yeah. of a hipster, right? I'm kind of into it. Like I'm, I'm actually not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not hating it. I would I, love to I see had, it. I had a glass of bone dry white Zinfandel. I don't know if you had the Turley white Zin. No, but I wanted to try it. Was it delicious? Yeah. Yeah, it was. It yeah. was. I had it. I had it. Um, this is a while back, but in San Francisco by the glass. Anyway, it was really fascinating. So it is making sort of this like hipster comeback, you know, in a different style, though. In yeah, a more no, yeah, not as not style. as like, you know, sweet as your grandma rem may remember. So you might have to add a little simple syrup. But, right, right. Um, <laughs> but you know, right. it's like a dry rosé. Eh? Um, we are moving to Frog's Leap. And I, I will just warn you up front. It's really hard for me to not wax poetic about Frog's Leap because. Do it. They deserve I, it. They do deserve yeah. it. Yeah. I love Frog's Leap. I think this is a this is not just a wine, but a winery and people yeah. that I just am so in love with. Yeah. Um, and anytime someone says, "Hey, you know, I've got I literally have time for one wine tasting. It's my first time here. Where should I go?" It is one hundred percent, without a doubt, go to Frog's Leap. It sits. Yeah smack dab in the center of the valley. It's got, you know, almost 360 views over to the Vaca side, over to the Mayakama side. Um, views of the vineyards, you're, you know, sitting among orchards, and then the people are just so wonderful and so hospitable. It is the epitome of Napa Valley hospitality, and I am such a fan of theirs. Um, all they do, and these, you know, these wines, Oh my gosh, the history of Frog's Leap, such a great story, how they got started. Um, you know, you mentioned Turley, Larry yeah. Turley and John Williams were the original founders of Frog's Leap. Uh, once upon a time, of course, Larry, Larry Turley set off to do his own thing. Um, and apparently is is kicking back with White's in, um, <laughs> among many other things. Um, but you know, John John is a really interesting guy. He 
he his well I won't say his biggest claim to fame because I think anybody that that can do what he did and it's not his biggest claim to fame which is he was the only employee at Stag's Leap Wine Cellars and bottled the 1973 Stag's Leap Cabernet that won the judgment of Paris tasting in 1976. Um, yeah. So the fact that he was like yeah, been there, done that, keep it moving. And like now he'd probably like make fun of me now and tell me I'm crazy. But, um, yeah. you know, for a guy to like do that so early in his career and then have yeah. the one that he's had subsequently. I know. Um, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And I think um, I love their website. I don't know if you me too. <laughs> visited it recently, it's but the, um, yes, anyone, you best. know, at, at, at home, you know, if you haven't checked out their website, you should because they, they there's so much history. Mm -hmm. And it's so fun because yes. they have the real story. And then you can see they have this like redaction where it's still there. You can read it. There's like all the actual stuff that happened. And then, then the more like sort of PR, you know, approved version is there too. But you can read this like crazy history. And yeah. I think, you know, speaking of, of Stag's Leap, um, I, I feel like I read on the on the website that like he, John totaled Warren Winiarski's car like five days. <laughs> yeah on the like his on his yeah. fifth day on the job or something like yeah. that <laughs> very very john and yeah. you know I, I think that their website is so representative of the people there they just like they don't take themselves that seriously the wines are so drinkable and yummy and you know you drink them and you're like it's like you know they're they're good they're simple and then you like you sit there for a minute and you dive yeah. deeper and deeper and deeper and you're like Oh, there's like something else yeah. here. Like this is actually oh, a really yeah. sort of cerebral wine if you let it. And I yeah. think that's like, it just speaks to them. And like, I think John Williams for sure, Jonah Beer, um, the vice oh, president awesome. there. I think like, yeah, you know, the over. two of them forget it. Like if you have an afternoon with them, like please write off your week. Um, those two <laughs> together are just like, they're, I mean, amazing, but crazy. Um, yeah. you, if you've never met Jonah, I mean, just go to Frog Leap anytime he's out there because he's not traveling yeah. right now. So um, but you could also yeah. see him on some TV. He did a great uh, blind tasting session oh, recently yeah. with, um, he's done two now. So he did one just recently with Jody Bronstein, my uh, oh. our former sommelier at press. Oh. Or actually, she's still at press. I'm not at press. <laughs> um, so she's the, one of the sommeliers at press. And he did one um, before that with, um, I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting her name. She's a wonderful winemaker uh, who works. Megan, yes, um, Megan uh, Zerbel, Zer Zobel, um, who works for uh, Atelier Melka. Um, I think I'm getting that right. Sorry, yes, Megan. I don't think I don't um, think okay. she did anymore, but she did. Okay, yes. okay. Yep. Um, anyway, I think that gives you a pretty good picture of John Williams. Anyway, um, back to Frogsley. You know, John back in the day in the '80s. He started catching wind, being, you know, being hippies in California, um, started catching wind of organic farming. And, you know, you have to remember, this is like 30 years ago. Nobody was talking about organics. There was no Whole Foods. No. Um, there was, you know, right. you there wasn't an organic section at, at the Publix or the, you yeah. know, whatever grocery store you're shopping at. Um, this was like, right. you know, just hippie farming and there wasn't yeah. very much information. And so he saw an opportunity early on in California's um, winemaking uh, history and said, you know what? I think that we can do better. I think that organics is the future and I am going to be here to support it. So he was really one of the early, not yeah. adopters because they didn't own vineyards at the time, but really yeah. someone who was like, I will pay you the right amount of money it takes to make sure that these grapes are organic. Um, yeah. And I think, I think, you know, just a, a huge supporter early on. And in uh, 1989, we actually got uh, CCOF status. So they became a certified winery, um, yeah. certified organic winery in, in Napa yeah. Valley. So that was, you know, yeah. one of the first, I think them and Spotswood, they were among the first two to be certified organic. I, and I think it's a great point that you make that um, back in the day, I mean, now people are very aware of organics and there's whole foods and people talk about it, but you know, they had to really just believe in it themselves yes. and want to do this because they knew it was the right thing to do for for the earth for their you know next generations and all that and it wasn't wasn't to sort of fit into a, a response from, from the consumer at that point it was really like they set that you know yeah. as a precedent for themselves yes so i respect yeah. it more for that reason yeah and you know i like i just think back to a time like when there was no internet uh and no twitter and like no social media to like poke and prod at you and like the amount of the amount of like diligence and like just steadfastness that it must have taken get the rest of the valley and be like you know what 
I know I just got here. I know I've only been here for like 10 years, but I think we should do it this way. Yeah. I think that's just, just, we can do better. And I think that's sort of, it's definitely the ML for Fog Leap still today. And, you know, why I have included them in this lineup, um, I, you know, the reasons that I've just listed, which are, which are many, but I think one of the biggest reasons is that they continue to iterate day after day after day and they don't stop. So it didn't right. stop at organic farming. They weren't like, all right, we're organic, see you later. Yeah. And then yeah. it went to biodiversity. You know, we're going to plant other things on our property, make sure that the, the environment is healthy. So, you know, not necessarily embracing biodynamics in, in more of the like the woo-woo sense, um, for lack of a better term, sorry. Um, technical but, term. Um, technical term, woo-woo. <laughs> um, you know, not necessarily embracing that, but looking at biodynamics and farming that, looking at regenerative farming, dry farming, doing experimental lots. You know, I think those are things that Foxy does really, really well. And I think. Um, that's also representative of the valley. And I think that's representative, I mean, people think of Napa as, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm generalizing, but sometimes I think of Napa as like, you know, a little like, you know, we've been there, done that, it, you know, we, we do Napa wines and they're really big and they're really ostentatious and it's just not the case. There is so yeah. much here that is happening um, at, at an experimental level that isn't just like, well, this is the way we've done it for forever. So um, this is the way we're gonna continue to do it. It's a region that really loves to 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 do things that are not the norm and they're not afraid to do it. And I think it's it's such a special thing about this place. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and and I wanted to just call out where it's from too. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, Rutherford, AVA, you know, kind of right in the heart of Napa. I believe this is the widest point in, in Napa, which is, as we said, like only five miles wide. Um, but it, it's, <laughs> such, it's such a um, historic AVA for, for Cabernet. And it also has this, you know, people call it this, the Rutherford dust. Um, yeah, which, which is this sort of like very fine grained, elegant texture to the tannin, um, which mm -hmm. I believe is like in full display in, in this glass, you know, mm -hmm. where you have mm -hmm. that beautiful structure, um, kind of, you know, that backbone of tannin of the wine, but it's so fine grained and it's so elegant. So just, just like a, yeah. beautiful, a beautiful glass of wine. And, and I have to admit that I opened this yesterday um, because I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited about it. I really wanted, I really wanted to go. So you have so much wine behind you. And then you were like, I'm just going to open this early. I was like, yeah, where would I possibly it's find wine? It's piece of the wine. I'm not, I'm not judging you, but I'm like. <laughs> but yeah, no, I was like, oh, I'm so excited about this. I just, I just really want to, want to, want to taste it. And, you know, I tasted it yesterday and I have to say like, it's such a, um, it's such a marker of a, well-made beautiful wine when it's actually tasting better today mm -hmm. you know it is it's actually improved yes. so yeah so you're so right you're so right on that yeah. yeah i don't i think um you know i i cor i actually i did not corb in any of these i opened all of them because i think they're gonna find homes um in my belly um and i'm not worried but yeah i think you know the marker of a great wine is you know many things but the ability to not only be drinkable the next day, but also sort of like improve. And I can totally see, I just opened this maybe two hours ago. I can totally see it um, getting better after a day. Cause it, you know, it just, it does feel a little bit, a little bit tight. I think this particular Napa Valley Cabernet, um, you know, it's, it's lower in alcohol. I think this is only what, 13 something, 13.8. Um, 13.8. So a little bit low lighter in alcohol. Yeah. yeah so yeah, pretty low for Napa. I mean, 17 is a fairly hot vintage. We had several heat spikes that year. Um, this was for sure harvested before the fires for anyone who's wondering. Um, you know, and I think this wine is when we, you know, we, we toss around the word classic a lot, you know, and I think when I think of classic Napa Cabernet, we're talking about classic in the sense of like, similar to the wines that were maybe being made in the 60s and 70s. So a little bit of a little less of the new French oak usage, um, you know, maybe a little lower in alcohol, maybe not quite as ripe. So maybe harvested at like, right. you know, 25 degrees bricks instead of like 29 degrees bricks. Um, and not that yeah. any of those are wrong, but I think, you know, you just think back to an era when those wines uh, were being made and we think of this wine as being a little bit more classic and reminiscent of that style. Yes. I, the word classic was exactly what I was thinking of as well, sort of classic, you know, elegant, mm -hmm. balanced. But I think also to your point, you know, we have such a, um, to go back to diversity where we started, you know, we have such a um, yeah. a, a diverse region. We have, um, even within the small valley, we have such a diverse group of 
of, of winemakers with their own styles. Um, and so I think there is something for everybody though, because if you do like that yeah. kind of richer, riper, you know, a little bit headier style, we've got you covered. And if you want the kind of like old school restraint, you know, when you want the chorus and um, yeah. style of yeah. wine, we have that too. So yeah. um, no, it's, it's really cool. And you know what? I, I was nervous to a degree moving to Napa Valley and working with a wine list that was entirely comprised of Napa Valley wines. We're like, how in the heck am I going to get 185 guests oh. in a night into like multiple bottles of wine that are going to pair with their multiple different courses with yeah. just these wines. And you realize very, very quickly that there are endless options. You know, you can start them with a great sparkling wine from Schramsberg that maybe has a little age on it. You can move them to a Riesling. You can then move them to maybe to, you know, a bigger bodied white. Like I think a great example is a wine that you talked about the other day, that Edge Hill uh, mixed whites with the Rivola Jala, right? A little yes. bigger, broader, like, and then, you know, you move to something like a Zinfandel to, to get them through the next course. Maybe a Zin with age, maybe it's from Brown, maybe it's from like Storybook, right? Where, you you know, this like really cool winery up in Calistoga way out there that was founded back in the like 60s and 70s. Andre Teletif told them to to plant Zinfandel instead of Cabernet. Yeah. And he was yeah. like, you're crazy. Um, and then you move them to whatever Napa Cab is going to like blow their minds. Um, and whether that's more classically styled a la Frog's Leap or whether that's something larger and, and bigger and a little bit more bombastic, um, yeah. you know, you have all those options. And as a sommelier, that creative constraint was my favorite to work with. And it really yeah. pushed me as a wine right. professional to dig a little bit deeper um, and fall in love with the region just a little right. bit more. And, and you can actually end with a dessert wine from the region too. Oh my gosh, Vanessa. Yeah. That was my favorite part because nobody thinks of Napa Valley dessert wines. They oh. think of, they're like, well, I guess I'll have like an Amaro or a cocktail. Oh no, I had oh, no. the coolest dessert wines on my wine list. We had things from, well, we had Johannesburg Riesling. So back in the day, that was a thing. So we would have like um, Joseph Phelps, like 1980s Johannesburg Riesling that was fortified, mm -hmm. long vineyards. One of the coolest things that ever happened to me in my career was uh, I, a table had asked for a Chateau Yquem, so the you know the very famous dessert wine, yes. and I yes. said, you know, I'm so sorry, we're all in the Valley wine list. Um, I don't have Yquem, but I do have this really cool uh, dessert wine that you know you may not have heard of before, but I think it's really delicious. Mm -hmm. And so they said, what is it? And I said, well, it's um, 1991 uh, Long Vineyards Johannesburg Riesling. And this woman who I hadn't talked all night, she peeks up at me and she goes, what size bottle is that? I said, oh, I think it's a 500 milliliter. And she goes, I made that wine. And I go, what do you mean <laughs> you made that wine? Like Long Vineyards is defunct. Like it's now owned by Gandona. Oh my and gosh. She said, yes. And she proceeded to tell me the story of how she um, she was in Germany working. A, this is wild. This is like Napa Valley in a nutshell. We can wrap up after this probably. Um, so she's in Germany and she is, uh, she, she's just found out that she uh, is expecting. And she has terrible morning sickness and she is talking to her neighbor and neighbor says, um, and I'm sure this is not a, a approved doctor advice, but the neighbor says, oh, Riesling has a compound in it that gets rid of morning sickness. So she said, I fell in love with Riesling when I was in Germany. And when I moved to Napa Valley to get a wine job, I only wanted to work somewhere that worked with Riesling. And so she went to go oh work God. with Zalma Long at Long Vineyards, who's this acclaimed wow. winemaker. Um, and so she said, I, I wanted to continue the Riesling program there. And so I made this wine. Um, and so we opened it and we served it and it was wonderful and it was to date clearly one of the most memorable experiences I've ever had and so that is how Riesling <laughs> worked its way into my lineup multiple times um, and you know I think going back to what we were talking about this this sense of community in Napa Valley not only can you go to Napa and have amazing culinary experiences and go to wineries but you you get to meet the people mm -hmm. and the people are the people are there they live there they work there um, their kids go to school there um, yeah. it, there is a sense of, of community um, and it's just it's just so clear from yeah. living there and working there that um, you know people want that part of the valley to survive. It's something that means a lot to them, um, yeah. and it it doesn't appear to be going anywhere. No, no, and 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 you're you're right. And and to go back to kind of you know when we first moved here, but I remember you know meet, meeting the people. I'm like, oh my gosh, like but like your name's on the bottle. I used to sell yes. the bottle. <laughs> it's you, and there's just like a celebrity to me, you know. And they're so down to earth and welcoming, and just a, oh, a, nice. you know, a wonderful 
wonderful community of people who really truly love this place and for a really good reason. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm so proud to be a part of this community and I'm so proud to be a California resident in general and um Me too. Yeah, it's just it's been the the thrill of a lifetime and I'm so glad that you're there too. I'm so excited to be back to see yeah. your face in person. Too. I know, I know. Um, I can't wait for you to be back. <laughs> This has been so much fun. We have tasted three wines just to wrap everything up. Uh, the first was the Stony Hill Riesling 2018. Um, then we went to the 2018 Brown Estate Zinfandel. And then we headed to the 2017 Frog's Leap from Rutherford. Um, and that that was our lineup today. And I, I think we did really well. Um, I know that we we haven't heard feedback from others, but you know I think we can pat ourselves in the back and say great job because we found three really great wines or or um, drank three really great wines and had a lot of fun in the process. <laughs> Absolutely, I mean it was a win for me. I got to, to open three bottles of wine today. So. Heck yeah, I well, love it. And on which I opened yesterday, <laughs> it's another story. <laughs> yes. Well, California Wine Month is clearly off to a great start, and I am so grateful that you could be here with me today, Vanessa. You are such a treat, um, as always. I would love to tell people where to find you. Um, so you're you're on Instagram at Vanessa Conlin. Um, wine Access. You're the head of wine. Um, so you go on. Yep. So you go on Wine Access and you look at all of the amazing selections they have there for wines. Um, and you help to spearhead all that, which is great. Um, you don't have to uh, end this series here. I'll be here next week. Vanessa will not be here, but I will be joined by Julia Coney and we will be traveling to the wider Appalachian of Central Coast AVA. Um, and we will be talking about three different wines again. And then the following week, we will be joined by Baxter Holmes, who I know you know, um, mm -hmm. and he's just wonderful. He is the, uh, the, the NBA writer for ESPN, senior staff writer. Uh, also James Beard award winning writer yep. and sort of the pulse between Napa, or not Napa Valley, the wine world and the basketball yep. world. So he's the mm -hmm. guy that really like put everything yeah. in the spotlight and was like, hey, LeBron James is drinking wine. Um, that was that guy. And then we're finishing up um, with, it, with I know, a great friend of yours, Brandon yeah. Sparks Gillis from Dragonette Cellars. Uh, we'll be heading down to Santa Barbara for that final um, of the series yeah. on, on the last yeah. Thursday of September. So September is going to be an amazing month. I will have a lot of wine. Um, so I hope you're around to help me drink it. Um, Vanessa, yes. that was you. <laughs> oh, I got you. <laughs> um, so we, we, uh, we hope to be a little bit more prompt next time at 1 PM and thank you all for bearing with us. We really appreciate it. And thank you to California wines for giving us the mic and letting us talk about, um, some of our favorite regions in California. It's really been a treat. So yeah. thanks Vanessa. Thanks for having me. And I won't be here on your other sessions, but I will definitely be watching. Yes, and probably at my back door, ready to drink after. I'm like, please, I have a glass. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we well, the best. Thank Bye. you all so much for watching. Bye.